Book three, chapters fourteen and fifteen of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston. Book three, chapters fourteen and fifteen. Chapter fourteen. How Moses sent some persons to search out the land of the Canaanites, and the largeness of their cities, and further that when those who were sent were returned, after forty days, and reported that they should not be a match for them, and extolled the strength of the Canaanites, the multitude were disturbed and fell into despair, and were resolved to stone Moses, and to return back again into Egypt, and serve the Egyptians. When Moses had led the Hebrews away from thence to a place called Paran, which was near to the borders of the Canaanites, and a place difficult to be continued in, he gathered the multitude together to a congregation, and standing in the midst of them he said, Of the two things that God determined to bestow upon us, liberty and the possession of a happy country, the one of them ye already are partakers of, by the gift of God, and the other you will quickly obtain. For we now have our abode near the borders of the Canaanites, and nothing can hinder the acquisition of it, when we now at last are fallen upon it. I say, not only no king or city, but neither the whole race of mankind, if they were all gathered together, could do it. Let us therefore prepare ourselves for the work, for the Canaanites will not resign up their land to us without fighting." but it must be wrested from them by great struggles in war. Let us then send spies, who may take a view of the goodness of the land, and what strength it is of, but above all things let us be of one mind, and let us honor God, who above all is our helper and a sister. When Moses had said thus, the multitude requited him with marks of respect, and chose twelve spies of the most eminent men, one out of each tribe, who, passing over all the land of Canaan, from the borders of Egypt, came to the city Hamath, and to Mount Lebanon, and having learned the nature of the land, and of its inhabitants, they came home, having spent forty days in the whole work. They also brought with them of the fruits which the land bare, and they also showed them the excellency of those fruits, and gave an account of the great quantity of the good things that land afforded, which were motives to the multitude to go to war. But then they terrified them again with the great difficulty there was in obtaining it, that the rivers were so large and deep that they could not be passed over, and that the hills were so high that they could not travel along for them, that the cities were strong with walls, and their firm fortifications round about them. They told them also that they found at Hebron the posterity of the giants, Accordingly, these spies, who had seen the land of Canaan, when they perceived that all these difficulties were greater there than they had met with since they came out of Egypt, they were affrighted at them themselves, and endeavored to affright the multitude also. So they supposed, from what they had heard, that it was impossible to get the possession of the country, and when the congregation was dissolved, they, their wives and children, continued their lamentation, as if God would not indeed assist them, but only promised them fair. They also again blamed Moses, and made a clamor against him and his brother Aaron the high priest. Accordingly they passed that night very ill, and with contumelious language against them. But in the morning they ran to a congregation, intending to stone Moses and Aaron, and so to return back into Egypt. But of the spies there were Joshua the son of Nun, of the tribe of Ephraim, and Caleb of the tribe of Judah, that were afraid of the consequence, and came into the midst of them, and stilled the multitude, and desired them to be of good courage, and neither to condemn God, as having told them lies, nor to hearken to those who had affrighted them, by telling them what was not true concerning the Canaanites, but to those that encouraged them to hope for good success and that they should gain possession of the happiness promised them, because neither the height of mountains nor the depth of rivers could hinder men of true courage from attempting them, especially while God would take care of them beforehand and be an assistant to them. Let us then go, said they, 
against our enemies, and have no suspicion of ill success, trusting in God to conduct us, and following those that are to be our leaders. Thus did these two exhort them, and endeavor to pacify the rage they were in. But Moses and Aaron fell on the ground and besought God, not for their own deliverance, but that he would put a stop to what the people were unwarily doing, and would bring their minds to a quiet temper, which were now disordered by their present passion. The cloud also did now appear, and stood over the tabernacle, and declared to them the presence of God to be there. Chapter 15 How Moses was displeased at this, and foretold that God was angry, and that they should continue in the wilderness for forty years, and not during that time either return into Egypt or take possession of Canaan. Moses came now boldly to the multitude, and informed them that God was moved at their abuse of him, and would inflict punishment upon them, not indeed such as they deserved for their sins, but such as parents inflict on their children, in order to their correction. For, he said, that when he was in the tabernacle, and was bewailing with tears that destruction which was coming upon them, God put him in mind what things he had done for them, and what benefits they had received from him, and yet how ungrateful they had been to him that just now they had been induced, through the timorousness of the spies, to think that their words were truer than his own promise to them, and that on this account, though he would not indeed destroy them all, nor utterly exterminate their nation, which he had honored more than any other part of mankind, yet he would not permit them to take possession of the land of Canaan, nor enjoy its happiness, but would make them wander in the wilderness, and live without a fixed habitation, and without a city, for forty years together, as a punishment for this their transgression. But that he had promised to give that land to our children, and that he would make them the possessors of those good things which, by your ungoverned passions, you have deprived yourselves of. When Moses had discoursed thus to them according to the direction of God, the multitude grieved and were in affliction, and entreated Moses to procure their reconciliation to God, and to permit them no longer to wander in the wilderness, but bestow cities upon them. But he replied that God would not admit of any such trial, for that God was not moved to this determination from any human levity or anger, but that he had judicially condemned them to that punishment. Now we are not to disbelieve that Moses, who was but a single person, pacified so many ten thousands when they were in anger, and converted them to a mildness temper. For God was with him, and prepared way to his persuasions of the multitude. And as they had often been disobedient, they were now sensible that such disobedience was disadvantageous to them, and that they had still thereby fallen into calamities. But this man was admirable for his virtue, and powerful in making men give credit to what he delivered, not only during the time of his natural life, but even there is still no one of the Hebrews who does not act even now as if Moses were present, and ready to punish him if he should do anything that is indecent. Nay, there is no one but is obedient to what laws he ordained, although they might be concealed in their transgressions. There are also many other demonstrations that his power was more than human, for still some there have been, who have come from the parts beyond Euphrates, a journey of four months, through many dangers and at great expenses, in honor of our temple. And yet, when they had offered their oblations, could not partake of their own sacrifices, because Moses had forbidden it, by somewhat in the law that did not permit them, or somewhat that had befallen them, which our ancient customs made inconsistent therewith. Some of these did not sacrifice at all, and others left their sacrifices in an imperfect condition. Many were not able, even at first, so much as to enter the temple, but went their ways in this as preferring a submission to the laws of Moses before the fulfilling of their own inclinations. They had no fear upon them that anybody could convict them, but only out of a reverence to their own conscience. Thus this legislation, which appeared to be divine, made this man to be esteemed as one superior to his own nature. Nay, further, a little before the beginning of this war, when Claudius was emperor of the Romans, 
and Ismael was our high priest, and when so great a famine was come upon us, that one-tenth deal of wheat was sold for four drachmae, and when no less than seventy cori of flour were brought into the temple, at the feast of unleavened bread, these cori are thirty-one Sicilian, but forty-one Athenian medimni, not one of the priests was so hardy as to eat one crumb of it, even while so great a distress was upon the land, and this out of a dread of the law, and of that wrath which God retains against acts of wickedness, even when no one can accuse the actors. Whence we are not to wonder at what was then done, while to this very day the writings left by Moses have so great a force, that even those that hate us do confess that he who established this settlement was God, and that it was by the means of Moses, and of his virtue. But as to these matters, let every one take them as he sees fit. End of Book 3, Chapters 14 and 15 End of Book 3